Uh, welcome everyone. It's great to see you here tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us for this conversation. Um, and welcome to the students who are with us as well from uh, history and art history. Uh, my name is Shauna McCabe and I'm the director of the Art Gallery of Guelph and I'd like to welcome you all as well as our um, guest tonight, uh, Takralik Partridge, as well as Taralik Duffy. <coughs> Um, to begin, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement on behalf of the Art Gallery of Guelph, which is hosting uh, this event tonight. Uh, Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. We acknowledge that the Art Gallery of Guelph resides on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, of the Anishinaabek peoples, who are the ancestral holders and today the treaty holders, um, of this land. We recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon covenant to this land and offer our res respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. We express our gratitude and recognize our responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live, work, and create. And as we're all gathered uh, virtually today, connected and yet physically dispersed, it's also a good moment to recognize um, how the different traditional lands we reside in and move through inform our lives. And we acknowledge the elders past, present and future of these lands with gratitude and respect. So a few de details, um, everyone is muted for this conversation. Um, and we invite you to use the chat area for questions uh, for the, for the um, artist and curator and we will return to the questions after the conversation and we'll probably um, can actually make everyone visible at that point too to have more of a dialogue. Um, the project that we're speaking about tonight, even though it's um, on view at the Art Gallery of Guelph now, um, actually started probably uh, you know, over 40 years ago. The Art Gallery of Guelph was founded in 1978 and began collecting the work of Inuit artists soon after that. And today, um, Inuit artwork represents about a quarter of our collection um, that to to in total has about 10,000 works. Um, and so in the last few years, we've, we've really sort of been focusing on this sort of sense of responsibility um, that we feel to engage in, and um, you know, in, in, interact and uh, display and share this, these collections of work from the North that we hold in public trust um, but it, by involving communities for whom the artworks hold the most relevance. And as a result, we invite, invited um, Takulik um, to work with us as an adjunct curator, and uh, she's in, in the process of curating a large exhibition, drawing on the gallery's collection, as well as uh, contemporary artists that will be on view this summer. Um, Takulik is uh, currently director of the Nordic Lab, uh, which is a project of Saw Gallery in Ottawa. Uh, writer and curator. She is originally from Nunavik and has been living uh, previously in Norway as well as the United States. Um, this project, um, uh, this exhibition we're talking about tonight, as well as the other uh, exhibition in the summer, builds on previous curatorial projects, um, including uh, the first Inuit curated project that was presented at the Art Gallery of Ontario and her role as um, previous editor at large for Inuit Art Quarterly. The exhibition that we're focusing on tonight is uh, currently at the Art Gallery of Guelph, um, which I mentioned, and we will reopen to the public on Tuesday. Inyo Sira, which means my life, um, creates a dialogue between um, two artists, um, and one of them who is with us tonight, Tara Lake Duffy, um, is a multidisciplinary artist and writer who lives and works uh, between Coral Harbor and Nunavut and Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And her work, uh, I'm just going to actually share my screen just briefly here. Um, so this is uh, just an, a little introduction to Tarlik's work. Um, her, she's she's uh, been working in everything from jewelry and apparel to graphic works, and her creative practice highlights uh, very distinct uh, Inuit experiences referencing inherited traditions that include uh, syllabics, it's a language and materials sal salvaged from her home territory of Nunavut, um, such as vertebrae, baleen, uh, antler and seal skin, as well as elements of um, contemporary culture. And so um, works like this, for example, um, or this, um, and we have more images of, of uh, her work as well coming up. Uh, so she's been uh, with the Art Gallery of Guelph as artist in residence um, 
and uh, to produce um, the and, and help develop the work for the exhibition uh, in Uslera. Um, some glimpses of the exhibition here, um, and we have uh, images of the work um, close up um, that follow this. Um, so this actually, um, you know, this exhibition actually emerged as part of the collaboration um, when Takralik began working with us, we were actually working on the larger project, and this exhibition sort of um, developed as part of that dialogue. Um, it also comes out of a personal relationship between Tarlik and Takralik that we'll talk about um, uh, shortly. So here's just some views of the exhibition, um, just so you have some perspective um, of what it looks like in the space and the various elements. There you go. And it's also uh, in, in particular a response to a single book called Pictures Out of My Life, which is a, an illustrated autobiography of the artist Pitsila Kashuna. Um, so just briefly, we'll talk more about Pitsilak, of course, but she was born in 1904 um, uh, on Nottingham Island in the Hudson Straits and spent her childhood in several camps on the South uh, Baffin coast. And ultimately she would settle permanently in Cape Dorset um, in the early 60s. She was among the first uh, in Cape Dorset to begin drawing and the most prolific. So um, this is just a glimpse at, at the book um, and what it looks like. The book itself was published in 1971 and, and it's an illustrated um, autobiography. Um, and by autobiography, obviously she didn't write it herself, but um, a, a woman named Dorothy Ebers actually did interviews um, with um, Pitsilak and uh, that is translated in both English and Slavics. Um, this is actually the second book to be published in English and Slavics, and the first was the Bible. So I know, um, perhaps we can start maybe, um, I know this is so key to how the exhibition developed, um, but um, I know this book played a role for both of you um, um, growing up, and that was part of um, what inspired this. So. Um, Takalik, do you want to start talking about the idea for this exhibition and how it evolved? Yes, thank you so much, Shana. Such a wonderful introduction. Uh, so my name is Takalik Partridge, as Shana said. I'm currently in Ottawa on unceded Anishinaabe Algonquin territory. And such a pleasure to be on here tonight with with you too and with uh, everybody who's here to join in on the conversation. Um, so I guess I'll start with where I started working with you, Shauna, was um, uh, I've been doing work with Musa Geddes, which is a found, uh, an art foundation in Guelph as well. I see that Sean's on the call. Hi, Sean. <laughs> um, and as part of that a resident, that residency, I was uh, invited to do by Elwood, Elwood Jimmy, who was um, the person that I'm working with, um, invited to do something uh, around the festival arts everywhere. Um, all of the artists in that residence were invited to to do some kind of intervention. And my intervention was to be um, an exhibition. And Shauna, you so kindly offered this space at HEG. And we did Altamat, which was uh, at that point, the idea about everyday photos of everyday life uh, taken by Inuit, uh, both professional photographers and non-professional photographers. Um, and then after that, we kept talking and you went and got a grant and we're continuing on the idea of Khaldamat every day, every day. Um, so this exhibition is in that vein as well. It's pictures out of Bitsilak's life and then also pictures out of the Khalik Dafi's life. Um, when you and I had first talked, I had told you that both the two of us were very uh, moved by this book when we were kids. And um, it's just like, for me, it's just a dream that we were able to pull something together with, and I was able to go and touch the, with gloves, <laughs> touch the images that Victula had uh, done with her own hands, you know? I just, um, 
I'm so, so happy with how it turned out too. And uh, it's just unfortunate that people can't go in person, but it's wonderful that you're doing this recording. And we reopen next week, so okay, good. <laughs> people can come. <laughs> We've also extended the exhibition, so it'll be up uh, through March, so. So how did, um, so you both grew up with the book. Uh, maybe talk about, had you actually spoken about, well, Tara, like your work comes out of the same ideas very much about everyday materials. Um, had you actually talked about Pitsilak's work before um, and creating work in relationship to it? Um, I don't know if we spoke about specifically creating before this project, but I know we've spoken about the book before because um, I do have a habit of going book shopping and book thrifting or buying stuff off that. And I remember finding it again and I had forgotten about it. Um, my mom used to have a copy in the hotel. They have a hotel uh, in Coral in Nunavut. Um, and so it was for the guests to look at. And I remember I would just flip through it uh, during lunch hours because that's where we'd spend a lot of our lunches. Um, so yeah, I've always been touched by it. And Dr. Lick and I often have conversations about absolutely everything. <laughs> and so... Um, I was just incredibly honored to have this because when I first started drawing, it's like not that I didn't take it seriously, but you just sort of think of it as not not art, but just an idea on a paper that I'm trying to get out of my head, like draw and click. Um, but obviously very influenced by the Inuit artists that I have been so fortunate to be influenced by, uh, just uh, surrounded by, I should say. Uh, since I was a young child and not even really realizing it because a lot of times too like I would dismiss some Inuit art as just creepy and weird <laughs> um, but that's something that I've come to really appreciate um, as and as well as just like the everyday items that Inuit have always drawn how it's changing and how the items that surround us are changing and how some people might not like outside of Nunavut or outside of being an Inuk everyday life wouldn't necessarily know that this is something that surrounds us every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but what do you think about like how? I think, we, you know, I think a long time ago, we hadn't talked about you doing work in response to Pitsulak's work, but um, we had talked about the book and both loving the book as children. I remember it was one of, um, ever since I was very young, it was one of the books that I just uh, would look at for a long time. And of course I didn't, I mean, I didn't read the words because they were maybe not as interesting for a little kid, but just those images are just sort of stuck in my mind. You know, the enormous mosquitoes, like if you look on the cover of the book, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're very simply drawn, but they're just, it's so effective as an image. Mm -hmm. And just the idea of how people would carry things when they're traveling. Look, you can see that she has the sewn um, pail or bucket, probably sewn out of seal skin, all the implements that she's carrying, and she's even carrying a baby, and those mosquitoes are attacking. And I, for me, it feels so real. Like it's like, it becomes real in my mind when I think about it, that those mosquitoes are that big. <laughs> they are, they really are that big. <laughs> <laughs> but just, oh, I just, I could, I just imagined all kinds of scenarios. And then to see that also as a child and be, and realize it that, realize that it was um, our fellow Inuk who had drawn those and that they were in a book and that, you know, this person was famous for that. Like they were known in the world. I feel like it, it was so valuable to, to understand that, that this is that important that it's in a book. And we actually have uh, not that work, but this work. <laughs> Just, yeah, very similar. Very yeah. similar. You can see her ulu is hanging down there by a string too. Mm. The mosquito's even trying to bite her feet. <laughs> yeah. And we had used this as um, beside this one um, as sort of the intro, the intro wall just and it's been kind of interesting, you know, um, when we did installation, actually, um, we were doing it kind of remotely, 
um, in, you know, through, by phone, basically, Tacrolic and Tyrolic uh, couldn't travel at the time. So, um, and then to deciding on what we were going to create, you know, pairings of and, and relationships between. So um, this work and this work um, just seemed to make a lot of sense because of the relationship of, you know, um, you know, older and younger. Um, and just the different environments, I think, too, like the change. And that's what I think I love so much about this, this exhibition is just the, you know, the traditional to contemporary environments that, that get captured. Also the yellow. <laughs> so when we were trying to figure out the wall color and, and we sort of noticed that there's this frequent yellow appearing in both uh, Tarlik and Pitsilat's work. <laughs> I love the yellow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hence the wall. So, yeah. <clears throat> Do you want to talk about this work, Tarlik? Yeah, um, it sort of calls back to like uh, when I was living back home. Uh, I had lived away from home for a long time, uh, and when I had left, I that was I just wanted out. I didn't want to be in Nunavut anymore. I was young, 17, 18, and I never went back for like. I mean, I visited every year, but I didn't go back back for about 17 years. And I had this deep longing for home uh, that was, uh, it's still in me. Like I can't, it's like I, I had spent all that time trying to get away. And now I'm trying to spend all my time to go back. And uh, I remember just taking pictures all the time before smartphones. I just take pictures of everything uh, like Pepsi drying in a porch or my mom's fish heads uh, uh, fermenting in, in a, in a, like a, uh, a pot just anywhere or just kids walking to the co-op like everything became beautiful to me everything became something that was precious whereas before when I was living there it's like to me it was like the tv what the things that were on the tv is what I felt was more important or more precious or that's what I wanted I was missing out on the world and so those those drawings too like when I would snap those pictures I didn't always have the best quality camera but it, there are these moments that I wanted to remember forever in a way that maybe wouldn't deteriorate <laughs> uh, and so those two girls especially I don't know if that's a sewer pump or a water pump I'm not sure but they're just having like their popsicles by the quick stop and uh, just how colorful the clothing is with the young people and so it sort of uh, is like a call and response to like how colorful Pitsulaf's work is and and yeah, that's just, it was just this need, this, uh, this need to document and to remember and to sort of like blow kisses back to Nunavut mm -hmm. and how it, there is beauty and everything there. And I think for the longest time you, you hear Nunavut described as, you know, not so much now, but like the barren lands or like, why would you live there? Like, why does anyone live there? Even when I was traveling, people would often say these things to me, but there's just so much beauty and but when I was drawing that picture, <laughs> this is why I need taqalik in my life because I'm constantly writing myself off or constantly thinking something's not good because I, it's, you know, you do this comparison to the Inuit artists that I really admire. And I was like, there's just, I just don't think it's as cool or as good. Or I was like, is this a, some shitty children's book illustration that I've drawn? You know, you just don't know. And so I really appreciate <laughs> having... Um, uh, just Taqalik's belief in me and then seeing it installed uh, it actually made me cry with, along with the yellow and to see it along with her work in person really seeing it come to life I could see uh, sort of how they are related whereas while I was doing the work it was a little bit more difficult to feel confident <laughs> that my work should be shown along or could be shown alongside hers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and the relationships run like right through it. So the you know the child with the dog in the coat and the jacket uh, in the hood, and then um, you know in relationship to the children being carried and totally. It's like that, like with her and all the baggage too. Like the young woman who was smoking the cigarette with the northern bag, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. seen walking with the co-op bags or the northern bags, <laughs> and the leggings. You know, the things everywhere. And yeah, and you design leggings, right? I do. Yes, it's been a while since I designed leggings. Some, um, but yeah, I love I love the idea of putting art on everything and anything because there's no real limits to 
uh, mm-hmm. canvas, I guess, you know, and it's nice to have living billboards of people, not so much for advertisement, but just to mm-hmm. see uh, also representation, just you could see it, um, Inuit syllabics or things that are our culture on our clothes wasn't something you really, really saw growing up besides like homemade chapaks with skidoo on them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And these, there are quite a few uh, works by Pitsilak in the exhibition. Um, Takilik, do you want to talk about how you selected those? Yeah, I mean, I, of course, going with a theme about scenes from everyday life, um, but also a sense of movement, a sense of, uh, I, I like work that seems to have like a sort of contained singularity. I don't know if that describes it well, but like it's just sort of striking, unstriking thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you can see these are quite circular Mm-hmm. And even though, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, there, there's a circular kind of form to that. Um, a lot of uh, Dakalik's work is like that as well. Um, and yeah, the movement, I just, uh, you know, I mean, all of her work is, it's, it feels alive anyway, but some of them are just so, um, so striking and so vibrant. Mm-hmm. Because we left a lot out. <laughs> yes, and it's like it's not. I mean, it's not unfortunate, but it's it is unfortunate that we didn't have like a, a giant room. But yeah, I mean, like look at these. They're just so gorgeous. Mm-hmm. They're beautiful. I love I love the perspective. Like you know that the one on the right with the woman standing on on the rocky shore and then you know looking out to uh, the people on the kayaks and the, the sea. It's like it's, the, the perspective is that you know, what's in front of her is sort of flattened down to our 2D kind of view. And it just, I, it feels enormous to me. Mm-hmm. You know, you can say you feel the power of the ocean. Yeah. In the end, there's no, it's not contained by like a linear frame. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, the dogs. Yeah, <laughs> childhood too, like going out boating or being on the land. And so there are so many similarities to like how I grew up going out camping. And so you could see like the flashes of uh, what her life was what, seeming so long ago and how much oh, we seem to have lost, but how much is still really much alive and very much there, even uh, while we were growing up. Like getting water too was one of the things if you're out camping and then that was one of the things like you go get the water mm-hmm. or your tiliok to go get the water and you do it with a pot as opposed to like the the implements that Takalik was talking about in the cover of the book but that's something that I, I had done as a child you know um, go get fresh water for tea or for cooking or washing whatever mm-hmm. and you mentioned you know that um what you were doing is sort of documenting and remembering and I think that's what she was doing as well um documenting for you know so we can all remember that you know, the, the, uh, sort of a traditional um life right in the north yeah and it's so easy to dismiss uh like even my own memories or even five years ago but life has completely changed uh even from a couple of years you know with COVID and everyone's isolating and we're less free to move around. Uh, and so when I was there, I just, I did have the sense of urgency to, you know, capture as much as I could take photos or draw or like collect bones. Um, uh, there's just a sense of, I don't know how long this is gonna last. And, and maybe I, I did develop an appreciation for the culture as it is now. And obviously I just find everything about Inuit just beautiful and the children everywhere and just the freedom that is in our communities that's totally different than than the city vibe you know uh, and the landmarks <laughs> yeah and I can understand like how prolific she is I, I, I had a sense of that when I began drawing for this sh- uh, exhibition it's like you know, the ideas keep coming and you want to do more and more and more and more and then <laughs> You realize you've had too many now, or I, like I still have so many drawings that I want to do, or that aren't finished yet, uh, along the same vein. But I do really appreciate you both for 
the invitation because I didn't really see myself in this like this this these kinds of drawings um, but it's really something that I, I've fallen in love with like I wasn't sure I could could draw kids as opposed to just like a pop can <laughs> <laughs> I know. And so one of the things that was interesting is that you do sort of work in these like almost, you know, three different forms at the same time. So digital drawing, pencil crayon drawing, just pencil drawing, actually four, um, yeah. and then prints, prints from digital drawings and other drawings. So do you want to just talk about kind of the fluidity of, of how you, you're working? Yeah, I think uh, the pencil is just how I sort of get the idea down and I feel good. And then I want to bring it to life more with color. Um, but then I do get afraid of ruining uh, the piece or not being able to come back from it if I've decided to color something and I change my mind, like I can become a little bit uh, of an anxious type as opposed, I wish I could just be freer. <laughs> but I think that's where I, I find comfort in digital where I can just go and play. And then if I do wanna uh, pull back, I can. But I'm glad that Taqalik would really encourage me. Like she said, no, I want, like your drawings, your hands have paper, whereas that felt a little naked to me when I was used to sort of um, going into the digital realm or into the print realm. But uh, I really do find the beauty and the power in like the hand to page or the hand to paper. Um, but I would like to get into like silk screen printing now too for instead of like the digital prints, maybe going that and, and silk screening it down. Uh, to kind of get the effect that I get from digital printing. Mm -hmm. um, but those yeah. two are really personal. <laughs> yeah. You wanna talk a little bit about those? Which one, let me see. Oh yes, 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 Oh, My mom, <laughs> happiest times in uh, our home, which can be kind of a grumpy house sometimes. It's when my mom has the accordion out, it's just happy fun time she's in great good mood she'll pull out <laughs> her purple accordion and my son will dance and she just sits in her chair that that's her chair or you know she's always on the phone either with her friends or uh, counseling people because she works uh, as a pastor but yeah I just loved and just she normally won't smile if I want to take her picture but if she's playing one of her instruments she'll smile <laughs> so to me that was a very a very precious uh, drawing to have my mom. And then the drawing next to it is actually my Anana Chef's accordion. And uh, she would play often to at community hall or, and I actually didn't remember uh, what her accordion looked like, but I was visiting my uncle one day for lunch and I noticed that the panther, and I love black panthers, are one of my favorite uh, animals as well. And I was wondering, I thought it was just the most beautiful accordion and my aunt had told me it was my Anana Chef's. So I quickly just had snapped a picture and I wanted to make a print out of it too for like a, a crew neck print. Um, and yeah, these are just things to like somehow, uh, what's the word, uh, not a time capsule, I'm, but you know, uh, immortalize is not the right word, but in, in a way, uh, keep it from eroding or my little, my way of um, remembering something forever. And it's not even on purpose, I guess you just sort of, I wouldn't have even thought of the two together, which is ridiculous because it seems obvious, but just the music with the accordions that's in my family line. Yeah, and I know, so looking at, you know, like the, the Coke cans and the, um, the, the you, you sort of, in the past have done, dealt with sort of these single objects as well. And then, so like going from like objects to these scenes right this the these like these you know um individuals like like her playing and we have more of those um this is uh yeah and it gives you a bit more of the background i suppose or like context yeah. to the piece i was actually you had posted the photograph that the one on the right is based on and i went to your facebook to see if i could find it but i couldn't find it <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah. the scarf yes yeah yeah, she's so, she's so, I love, uh, she's actually just recently passed away, but one of my most favorite cherished elders, and um, I would always take pictures, always, I still do to this day, and uh, I remember we were at her cabin, and I asked if she would put on my click scarf, you know, and then I'd actually give, she asked her if she wanted that one or the Pepsi one, she wanted the Pepsi one, or the Pepsi one, mm -hmm. but I snapped the picture of her with the click, and uh, my mom was apologizing for me, saying, oh, 
you know, my daughter saw was taking pictures and then the lady was just like, um, seven, um, uh, seven o'clock was just like, um, how you Maya, which like I know her, which was so warm because she was just like basically giving me permission to take as many pictures as I wanted and, and be welcome because sometimes like I've suffered a lot of scorn taking pictures before social media, mm -hmm. um, made things a little bit more acceptable but I would sneak photos of uh, uh, like meat on cardboard or our eating because it was something that we weren't we were told not to do and you wouldn't do because there was still a level of shame involved like my nana chap would tell me to warn her if I was ever going to come over with a khadranak or a non-inuk person so that's how I grew up and so I've seen the change from uh you know, a little bit of shame to like complete celebration, <laughs> which is wonderful. But yeah, I've definitely lived in a time where sometimes still, you know, if you're taking photos, people can get a little uncomfortable, but I'll do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, that's at her cabin, my favorite place to be where there's no English spoken and you just sit and drink tea and eat pile of biscuits or palawak. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Simon Sigjerek, one of the best things that could ever happen as a child where it feels like nothing ever happens in your home community is like a concert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A bunch of people fly in. It's like the most exciting, go like better than any concert I think I've gone to even as an adult. <laughs> when was this actually? Uh, Rankin Inlet, I think that would have been. That was from a picture. I can't remember specifically what concert, but there was one time I was visiting family in Rankin, and I don't know if it was like a CBC thing, but, and my mom would let me stay out a little bit later at the hall, as long as the music and everything was going on, I was allowed to be out, which was very rare. And then everyone's stomping and kids are running around. And I don't know, one of the, some of the best memories, and he's totally like a real rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Famous, you know. Very famous. To this day, if he, if his, I play his music on YouTube, I actually start stomping and get <laughs> <laughs> carried away. And these are a couple of the, the, the prints from Digital Drawings. Yes, yes, yes. You can see sort of the different consistency of the drawing because of that. Um, it's interesting looking at like her drawing of water here and your, you know, how you the, how you yeah. the wall color on the background here, very similar. I do, yeah. And I love the, that. the detail of pattern. Yeah, I like the contrasting things. That, like I said, the things that I probably wouldn't have found beautiful or even noticed growing up at this, as you're older, you just sort of, just the plywood and along with like the rusted stove or... You know, Simon, he's easy to make look cool because he was just cool, <laughs> a cool guy with rubber boots with like the kami, not kami pucks, what is that? I can't remember that inside part, the, the duffel sock part of the kami. Uh, we say elliptic. Oh. So I think kami. they say kami puck in uh, Rankin. Right? I was, I'm a little bit second guessing myself, but I just think that's another thing that I would love to just draw singularly as a rubber boot with the, the duffel sock. <laughs> Let's see, so here's some of Pitsilak, just the pattern on hers as well. Yeah, the drawings, etchings on paper. Yeah, I, I really it. like. I love that. You know, the black and white. It shows. It makes you look at the details more closely. I think. Mm -hmm. We we were in the collection last week. Um, Takalik and Gail Kabluna and I, and we were. You know, a number of artists uh, have sort of take this approach to drawing the, the dress in the, um, with the lines, the vertical and horizontal lines. This appears sort of quite frequently in color and in black and white um, with other artists as well. Uh, yeah, I think the, like the black and white contrast or the contrast between darker and lighter shades of things is very, you know, like that's, something that I do in my own work and I've seen and especially in clothing Gail and I were actually talking about um, her tapestry that she's working on that uh, sort of in relation to her grandmother's tapestries and how the work on the edging of her grandmother's tapestries is that contrast I think it really 
goes to uh, clothing used to always be made out of animal skins, which are just various shades of browns and blacks and whites. So what people had to work with was the contrast in, in darkness and lightness. And it's just really striking. And sorry, go ahead. No, it'd be you. <laughs> well, you and I have talked about this before. Like, remember that black and white jumper that we were looking at a picture of? I think it's from the 1950s or something. <laughs> it's just the contrast too in the geometric shapes. Or like I said, the window working with just like the white classic along with the gray. And it's like this beautiful uh, soft gradient. And as soon as we had our chance to work with colors, it's like, you see like the Hudson Bay lines kind of on jackets. And I like the simplicity of that kind of contrast. And I think it's sort of the same as like the old advertisements, like Pilot Biscuits being like white and green with a little splash of red here, or like even the China Lily with the black and the, uh, the yellow. Uh, and I do love black and white. That's why I like, I'm very much a black and white kind of person too. Like with the syllabic leggings I had first designed, like. And I see that in Takalik's heart beads that she, beaded hearts that she had just completed that I wanted to buy. They've already sold, but you know, red and then the black and the white. This is just something beautiful about I can make it. more. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just mad about it. <laughs> yeah, but this is something so beautiful and timeless about, I think, black and white. And, okay, and I need to make the faster of it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the boldness of when you choose color too, because sometimes I question my my color choices. The image on the right is the only image that we have from the book, actually. So, um, you know, that's how prolific she is. She, we actually have so many of her works and none from the book except for one. So, um, amazing. The only overlap. Let's see here. More, I love these ones. Mm -hmm. I love the black, and yeah, this is the drawing, straight drawing, which is what inspired me to do like the eye chart, just the pencil, um, because I have to like to ink it, but definitely inspired by uh, just something beautiful about just the lines, I guess. But her work is just amazing, I could look at it forever. <clears throat> look how strong she must be two caribou heads in her backpack. Mm -hmm. And her clinic almost looks like a nano, but it's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love it. Tug of war too. We played that like Just so looking. it's you know it's such a <sighs> typical game for any occasion, Christmas games or Easter games or Canada Day or whatever. And like everybody can join in, yeah. kids, adults. Have you ever, did you ever win? Did you ever go one-on-one -on -one with anybody? <laughs> no, but it's like, it's amazing that it, when it just suddenly goes and then the one side is the loser. Yeah. And the other one, it just, it, it's weird. It's funny because they're all laughing because it's sort of like a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, making me homesick. One of the, the um, things we've been working on for the upcoming exhibition that Takralik is looking at is, um, you know, just these sort of aspects of everyday life. So, you know, play and recreation is kind of one of those and, you know, sustenance and hunting. And um, we've been kind of like building out these categories <laughs> as a way of organizing the work. In, in the collection. Yeah, we were talking a bit about like, you know, at the start you said something about um, addressing the kind of history of how Indigenous work has been shown yeah. in institutions. Yeah. For me, like, and there's also this question about, well, are things that are being presented um, kind of ethnographic and just kind of show and tell or are they or are they something else and for me it's like it's about a celebration of the things that are important to Inuit and um, 
wanting to show things that I think other Inuit would be interested in seeing, hopefully in person if it can happen, but also, you know, having documented or having, uh, you know, for discussion, um, showing the things that I feel resonate with my community members. And for me, it's so, um, you know, the every day is so important um, to celebrate in Indigenous communities, in Inuit communities, like the, the, the small beautiful things or the things that are not considered to be beautiful, but that are of importance to our everyday lives. I want to celebrate those things because um, it's really just amazing that we exist. If you look at these old illustrations of how people lived and how they survived, and then now, you know, and celebrating those, and then also celebrating those things, those moments, like the Khalik was saying, like she wanted to document them and she felt that they were so important to document. Like, a lot of those moments, it's like they would just be thrown away and they're not seen to be important. They're not fancy, but um, mm -hmm. to me, they're real treasures. Mm -hmm. That's what, it's so important. Uh, or like that colleague was saying, even the carnation milk, which uh, when I'd finished, it was one of my prouder moments to one of my, one of, one of the girls that would bully me growing up, but we're friends now. <laughs> <laughs> Thing that was she really loved it and how you know she like it's a strange thing but it's one of well, like I grew up my dad would put it in our bottles and we ate, ate it in our cereal mixed with water and um it almost feels like I've grown up in an older time than I actually grew up uh with like shelf milk or carnation or things like this that you might not think are precious but I would call like mother's milk and it's on every counter in Nunavut, almost every table, every fridge, and it's something that would connect you even to a, a very mean childhood bully. <laughs> <laughs> but so that we could both appreciate this drawing. Um, and it is something beautiful and strange because it's uh, int introduced to us, um, obviously by colonialism and uh, the Khadrunat coming in and giving us sugar and flour and shelf milk <laughs> it's like something that people say it's not really good but then you grew up with it and that's good to you you're used to it and it's like a comfort right like i have a can of carnation in my cup could you I know if i can now i could pilot biscuits i can you can yeah <laughs> yeah i remember like click i don't know i actually have click now because I, I don't know if i'd eat it but i remember growing up camping uh and if my uncle gabriel was frying it up on a frying pan over the Coleman stove and I would literally salivate because it was just like the most delicious smell just <laughs> that you could ever imagine especially if you're out camping and not a lot of food and your grub box is getting low and you're out of the junk that you brought from the northern or the co-op. <laughs> I mean yeah. everything tastes amazing when you're camping. That's so true. <laughs> Even if it's fried with a few mosquitoes in there. Oh <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So this, so these are just great. These are these are little old. Well, this is twenty twenty one. These are um, pre yeah. this exhibition, though. Yeah, um, really. I think you were sort of looking at kind of pop pop art, sort of pop culture. Yes, which I still want to keep uh, continuing on, and uh, like there's so many different things I want to draw. That I, I mean, I actually have drawn, but I just haven't finished yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is sort of same thing, sort of just everything that was on my grandmother's table or things that were always around us or things that are on the shelves at the Northern that have always been there. And they are, they're beautiful in their own way because I am I do appreciate marketing and I like the simplicity of uh, contrasting colors that aren't too complicated. Mm -hmm. And China Lily is the best. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I remember the very first time I had like sushi soy sauce. I, I'd only ever had China Lee, which is very strong, very salty, right? So the very first time I had sort of the Kikoman, is it? <laughs> it's more popular in Nunavik, I think I was told. I don't know. But I think was... since the sushi craze, ah, I feel like long after Japan has moved on from sushi, Inuit will still be making sushi <laughs> like a thousand years from now. <laughs> It's funny. Well, there's something about like 
Taka, like you mentioned that, you know, that I, the idea I had had about, you know, sort of like looking at how we present Inuit art and, 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 you know, all of that. I actually think I got those ideas from you, or at least your, the way you had articulated something had kind of captured my mind because that was probably what I was thinking as well. But you had written some um, in relationship to another project, um, you know, really looking at sort of the whole tradition of owning, keeping, showing, um, and not showing uh, of in indigenous objects, right? That sort of whole history of, of um, you know, not only um, display, but then how um, the, the, the way the labels are written um, to the way they're presented, right? So um, that really interested me because, um, you know, like just thinking about Inuit collections and how they are typically presented, it's, it's by nature and because they're in museums, they're out of context. And so um, what has been really amazing is to see sort of like, you know, these exhibitions are coming out of relationships. So, you know, your friendship with Terelik, um, also um, Gail Kabluna, who we mentioned, um, is, uh, you know, the great granddaughter of Jesse Unark um, and has, you know, comes out of a lineage of artists who she is able to sort of see in our collection and create work in response to. And that is a way I think of like, you know, thinking differently about exhibition, right? The content itself is different and how we then talk about it is different. So that every day I think is the key, you know, like to me, it's like, aha, <laughs> light bulb went off when we did that first project about, you know, like through the photographs and just thinking like, oh, there's so much more uh, to look at here um, in terms of its potential, um, you know, and, and really important for us. So I, I really appreciate this sort of, you know, how this is evolving and the conversations that we're able to have with the collection and, and um, contemporary artists. So, and bringing those things together is really critical. I actually think like the exhibition is not, if not, it's not that it's not the most important thing, but it is not the only important thing in dealing with, um, you know, Inuit and, co and collections. Um, like my aim is really to have more Inuit access, especially older works or new works as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their relatives, their community members, like I want, like my personal project, you see me posting on Facebook and stuff is to find, especially because I know all the names in Nunavik, you can hear the dog screaming in the back, sorry about that. <laughs> um, to find works by, uh, late family members and to at least let family members know where those works are, you know, they're in Switzerland, they're in the States, they're wherever, mm -hmm. um, but also sometimes to have some of those works come back to, to families or to bring like Gail, bringing Gail, I mean, I'm not alone in this. So, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of indigenous curators are doing this, bringing mm -hmm family members or especially you know if they're artists but even if they're not artists to come and uh, spend time with these objects that are made by their late family members or their still living family members but they don't have any other way to access like I think that's one of the things that art institutions uh, can continue to do and continue to build on mm -hmm. you know like there's all different ways that that um, this heritage this these things that are, are part of us. They're like, I've heard, you know, Tanya Luke and Linklater describe them as our relatives. Like they are actually kind of living things um, that are part of our culture. Like there's many ways that we can approach um, to yeah. kind of heal the rift that is between these, this cultural uh, heritage and, and Inuit today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we're so bombarded, like we grew up so bombarded by like uh, Adunak culture, out, outside culture, MTV culture, when I was growing up, you know, much music, all these things that seem to hold more value only because they're like flashed in front of us so much more and so much more aggressively. And then the things that were most precious to us taken away uh, and stored away from, and so to, I've written, um, extended art labels for uh, the National Gallery before too. And I'm just the privilege of being able to look at art, look at like Takalik was saying, being able to go to Guelph and just being in the presence of, 
basically they're like uh, gifts to us as Inuit. You know, they're things that are, they're talking to us in a way that uh, maybe it would speak differently to someone who's not Inuk or not from the culture and things that were lost or seemingly lost, seemingly stolen, mm -hmm. seemingly taken away. And we need to, young people need to see it. Inuit people need to have it on their TV screens or in their libraries or somehow more accessible. Like a book says, it's like if there are relations and that, that connection needs to be strong and, and easily accessible, <laughs> like me calling Takalik uh, for any little thing that I <laughs> am going through or anything that annoys me. Um, I think the thing I felt growing up is you, you really did feel like things were lost or there wasn't as much that uh, you could have access to. It just wasn't there or I thought it wasn't there, but there's so much, it's we have such a richness of culture. And so many of our artists are so prolific in, in what they created. And, and so many of those pieces are just sitting away in galleries. And thankfully for that, because they've been preserved and they've been kept. But to be able to have Inuit or Indigenous creators, uh, curators uh, uh, start getting their hands on that and mm -hmm. somehow creating this new movement where art maybe <laughs> moves more north a little bit would be amazing. Absolutely. We got to get all the art out of the USA. <laughs> I think that's a little Twi'lek I don't even remember which uh, gallery it's in or somewhere, but I would love <laughs> I don't want to go to the States for nothing right now. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts? Oh well, yeah, just just to see, um, like seeing Gail with her relatives' work, you know, mm -hmm. and also, I mean, it, it also makes a really big difference to have. Like, I'm really, it's really wonderful to work with the staff at the Art Gallery of Guelph. You know, like really welcoming, um, and um, not high stress. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very inequality. Yeah. Uh, so, um, very you know, and then in the middle of the pandemic, and of course, like it, it actually works good because then there's nobody there. And then Gail had all this space to look at this stuff. Like, I think um, it just felt like it was meant to be. Well, and so much of it is actually dialogue as well. There was one point where, you know, she was working on, you know, looking at work related to her family, but then came to the vault because she said, I just want to be here for the dialogue. I just want to be here for the conversation yeah. because to hear like, you know, because, you know, the, the knowledge about the pieces comes out in conversation. Yeah. And that's how we sort of identify what will be in the summer exhibition. Um, and then start to build the relationships between, you know, that work and contemporary artists. So, so Taralik will actually be um, in that summer exhibition as well. So um, creating new work, which is great. Thank you so much. Thank you for that opportunity. Some, Cause sometimes I think I need a little push. Like I'm always creating and making, but uh, sometimes as an artist, when we're just trying to survive, you know, making earrings or jewelry or whatever, uh, following the hustle, uh, it's nice to have opportunities to to be inspired and to make stuff. I love making things. Mm -hmm. And so we won't tell what you're making. We'll leave that as a surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we won't reveal that. So because um, uh, it'll be it's 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 an amazing element of the exhibition. So someone else will do it probably. Just kidding. If we said <laughs> no, it. No, 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 no. No, we no, know no. that we've had the conversation that you're going to make this thing. So if somebody comes along with the idea and does something else, um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's called convergent evolution. <laughs> Those is things rough. happen at the same time, but they're yeah. not necessarily connected. No. <laughs> no. Very true. No. That urgency is important, I feel like, too, because otherwise we wouldn't move, maybe. Or yeah. we wouldn't move hands. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it makes decisions happen more quickly. <laughs> So, does anybody have any questions uh, they want to ask? Let me just check the chat here. Do -do. Uh, let me see. I'm 
I'm just going to go through and actually move everybody uh, into so we can see you all. Oh, yeah. This drawing too ain't a fool. I love it. Yeah, oh yeah. It's like something Bo would draw, I feel like. Blue insect. He's really into insects right now. Some people are, let's see. It's working. I just have to do it a few times for some people. I'm not sure why. Was talking about circular. I love circles too. Ge this geometry thing. Anyway, yeah, very much. I love that one. Drawn to circles and triangles. I think because also because of the ing ingenuity of Inuit, I think they understand like this. Not I don't want to say sacred geometry, but just like the strength of geometry in our design. I think it's evidence in the drawings as well as uh, clothing that is sewn or kamuti. You know, uh, all these things. I'm going to stop sharing now. Let's see. There should be. Does anybody have any questions? You should be able to uh, raise your hand and <coughs> talk now or put them in the chat. <coughs> no questions. No questions? I'll ask you a question. What is your favorite piece in the whole show? <laughs> um, favorite piece of yours? Oh, well, yeah, one of each. Let's do. Uh, your mom. <gasps> oh, my mom. I love it. I love all the busyness of it. Yeah. Mark. And you really capture her beautiful face. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, favorite of Pixula, maybe, uh, oh boy, it's so hard to pick. I know, that's a mean question. <laughs> could be that one, could be that one with the, with the water, with the perspective that's kind of stretched out. My children with the, uh, mos the mosquitoes and carrying. I think still as Indigenous women too, we still have that sense of carrying, like I've walked many a mile. I will never compare myself to our ancestors and what they went through, but you know, even just walking home in the freezing cold with Northern bags. <laughs> That's still my favorite piece, I think. Yeah. Well, you, uh, you searched far and wide to get a picture of a Northern bag for <laughs> reference. <laughs> I have bucks for it. <laughs> That's where that's where the residency money went because there was so much research. <laughs> research very important, very important. The, the, that detail is important. So. Yep. Mm. I just I I you know as someone who kind of comes from a background um, in you know very interested in landscape, but landscape in a really broad sense. So things like the arcade and the quick stop and oh, yes. you know every site, just like you know the northern store. I just love that so. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, I, I think it's so important to capture those sort of like, you know, those everyday landscapes, so. Right. Oh, I love that. I like, I like the, the you know, too, like the Kesha or like Hollywood Undead, all these like strange graffitis that just randomly something you, that ends up being something you read and see every single day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what becomes part of that, you know, your yeah. inner dialogue as you walk through these landscapes. And our Everlasting coral. There's been so many arcades. I remember just loving it as a kid, and then things are so temporary in coral. It seems like the fun things never seem to last very long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Arcades are unsustainable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Kai says he has no questions. I just want to say I really enjoyed the presentation and loved the work you shared with us today. Uh, Sean says thanks very much. Tyrolic and Sean, I look forward to seeing the exhibition next week. Oh, in the me. <laughs> Andrew, coming, all of you. Andrew yeah. has a question. 
Hello, thanks, thanks for this presentation. Very interesting to hear the, um, the dialogue among, among the three of you. Um, Ty Lake, I, I was uh, looking, looking up online your, your short bio, and there's a line in there. I wonder if you might speak to this just briefly. It says here that um, <clears throat> your work appeals to a wide range of customers, North and South, especially those that appreciate her model of, quote, ethically, harvesting her materials. What, um, what's embodied in that line? Oh my goodness. I think I, a little, I would jokingly sometimes say, cause you know, there's this whole movement of like, you know, people who are vegan or uh, really uh, conscious about uh, the treat, mistreatment of animals. And uh, I grew up quite uh, sensitive to um, animals as well, <laughs> which I was actually vegetarian for a long time. I was a very confused, identity confused Inu, but um, I would joke that I had sourced antler sometimes that was naturally dropped. So I'd say those were my vegan uh, pieces. Um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I've collected bones. Uh, most of the, both of the bones have been hunted and harvested for, for eating. And so they, they have been killed, you know, by Inuit, or we don't say kill in, uh, in what we say catch uh because i think Inuit's idea of uh eating and our relationship to animals is completely different um than uh let's say modern people who are very disconnected from the meat um, but there are some natural deaths so i say ethically it's kind of uh i don't know who wrote that <laughs> but i have used the word ethical and i don't know if i like it or not because i, I feel like it implies that there could be an unethical way of doing it. But when I first stumbled upon the carcasses, uh, I was just salvaging what I felt like was otherwise just rotting on the beach. And I could really feel the presence and the life force of the animal that was there. And you could just the feeling that it had already fed like my community and those joyous, uh, feasting that happens with it and then I was going to this rotting rotting gross uh, uh, carcass <laughs> and then sometimes when I would like knock over whatever was in the way uh, and then there'd be like maggots and then like the little birdies would come and start eating uh, those gross uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know I think that's I don't know if I'm making any sense but to me I think uh, there was this idea of not wasting and to use what's there and I don't like to see animal parts in the garbage uh, if, because we do say we use every part but that's not true so much uh, of everyone and it's not so true of our modern life because uh, we have the luxury of wasting now whereas before we didn't and so in my work I think people have been drawn to that and are drawn to the fact that they know that it's me going salvaging the pieces and you know I've taken caribou heads out of uh, the dump. It's more romantic to think of me on the beach with the uh, rotting carcasses, but I've also taken animal uh, parts out of the garbage or just on the road if a dog's dragged it out of somewhere. Like, and I think that's a very Inuk thing is to just to take something that might otherwise just be thrown away or not used and to just to turn it into something beautiful or useful. So I don't know if that uh, answers your question, but I try to be as ethical as I can be, but I can be a very unethical person. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that you have, um, in, since you haven't been able to go north or, or travel during the pandemic, at some points you were actually having asking people to send you things, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to source more materials. Yeah, yeah. It's it's actually very hard because, uh, like, uh, where I go get the bones, it's hard to find them first of all, and it's a little bit it can be dangerous because there's polar bears. And then just to get someone that would actually do it and then bring it to my mom's and then, you know, my dad will mail it to me. But, mm -hmm. uh, and one thing I loved about home too is mostly I would gather my own pieces, but it was nice when people come to the door too and they're like, hey, do you want to buy this uh, walrus stick for like 60 bucks or like whatever? <laughs> and I was like, yes. Or like sometimes they just leave it there. Sometimes there's like a trade that goes on, but uh, it's, it's helpful to everyone because it's like things that maybe they wouldn't use or would end up going in the garbage, something that's valuable to me, mm -hmm. some turn into something. Um, but I really do feel like it's an honor to the 
especially Kinaduwak and the bones. There's something very magical about what happened with me and finding the bones because it was definitely not something that I thought would become such a big thing. It's just something I really loved to do and I wanted to do. And it's the, I wish you could all come with me. Well, Shauna and Takali. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about the piece you made for the Reme? Oh, yes. Uh, I was invited to, I think it's a group exhibition, uh, which means at the same time. Uh, and I thought about this for a while, but I had like baleen as well from, I had got some source from a, a local hunter. And then I had a couple of pieces that my mom had saved from a hunt. And uh, bowhead whale hunting was prohibited in Nunavut for... Uh, I don't actually know how many years, but I do know that it was 65 years between the time my grandpa had last eaten bowhead to the time that he had hunted the bowhead for the first time and he had caught a big, huge bowhead in coral. It would have been in the 90s, late 90s. And my mom had saved me a piece. And I always wanted to do something special with that. Um, I'd use the other baleen or jewelry or whatever, but that particular piece I made into a corset. Um, and part of the reason why uh, foreign whalers were hunting bowhead so much was for the oil and everything, but also they were using the baleen for corsets for European women to look smaller and, and um, make their bodies smaller. And inadvertently, they were making Inuit bodies smaller because they had taken away our food source. And so, um, as I said, again, our relation to food is so different or was so different um, in, in that way. And so it was sort of this <laughs> conversation piece to try to say a lot in, 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 in a way um, and honor that piece of baleen from my grandpa's hunt. And just imagine not being able to eat your favorite food because an outside source had come and just completely almost wiped out an entire population. It would never have happened if Inuit had done that. But yeah, that's at the Remy. And it's uh, shown alongside with a huge piece because baling is so big, it could be up to like 10 feet. It's like so massive. And so just to and just take this big, massive whale and try to make a little skinny waist, that was kind of a <laughs> funny thing to do to a, a big whale's baling. Is it so, up right now? Yeah, uh, yeah. Up till March as well. I'm not actually sure how long, but it's up right now. We'll have to take a look online and find an image. Yeah. And you also have a show coming up at Saw. Oh, I'm so Maybe excited as well. about that. Do I? I'm very excited about the show coming up in Saw. It's like my, I feel like it's sort of in my ballpark. Not that this one wasn't, but like it's the pop art. It's going to be all these images of, uh, you know, like, the pop cans how I want uh, and I want to do things like on a really large scale sort of the idea too of like these big large animals that we were surrounded by too and maybe big huge pop cans and china lily and hp sauce in in the way that I play around with syllabics and I like to imagine a world where what if we did see syllabics everywhere or things were always written in Inuktitut or Inuktitut was the dominant language and how that would have change things for us growing up in our worldview. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> Inuit futurism. Yeah. <laughs> Alternative. Like, I'm also very capitalist, right? Because like it's in our, it's in my blood. I got Hudson Bay blood. They colonized my great grandmother's womb. <laughs> and so I feel like you can't, there's a certain, you can't escape this, this idea of like the China lily running through my veins and <laughs> <laughs> carnation milk I'm made of carnation milk so. <laughs> I'm silly but yeah I'm very I'm very excited about that show and I'm very excited that you you guys invited me to do the show I feel like it opened up another side of my thinking and my brain it's your tour of Ontario <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. Ontario. I can't go anywhere in zoom all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, thanks so much. I think um, we can wrap up. Um, thank you, Takelik, and thank you, Taralik, um, for the incredible conversation. And um, 
Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, do visit the exhibition. Uh, it will reopen. We, we reopen on Tuesday. We're open noon to five, um, Tuesday to Sundays. And um, uh, we hope you'll all see that exhibition as well as the one that Tacrylic will curate for the summer um, that will open in a few months. Um, yes, and Sean says, see you at Art, Arts Everywhere tomorrow morning. Yes. I feel like has another panel at 9 a.m. So <laughs> we'll let you Thank know. you so much, Shana. Yeah. Thank okay. Thank you all. Uh, have a good evening and uh, take care. And we'll see you all again soon. Good night. Good night, everyone. <laughs>